Well, hey, good morning. Man, it's good to see you guys. Thanks for being here. Um, obviously, we're in the middle of and wrapping up today our Vacation Bible School. It has been a, just a great weekend. Hannah and her team of people have done such a great job. We've had about 50 kids and have just really had a blast. Um, I just want to say, under epic fail, when it looks like I fell down, what I had to do was put my head on a bat and turn around eight times. I didn't fall down. The ground actually came up and hit me in the face. I'm not sure. It was crazy what happened. But anyway, and also Clay's fired. I, I, I hate to do that in front of everybody, but Clay, I'm about to let you go wherever you are because he cheated in our game. I'm just saying. If you are a guest today, um, if you've never been here before, never had a chance to fill out one of our communication cards, they're in the seat pocket there in front of you. I would encourage you sometime during the service to do that. If you stop by Welcome Central when you leave today, we've got a gift that we'd like to be able to give you as you go. And then after all of this today, uh, there's going to be a picnic. There's supposed to be a food fight that I'm right in the middle of because the kids gave so much money for our um, for our, our mission that we're supporting. So that's just a really cool thing. And, um, and we're starting a new series today. It has been called the greatest sermon that's ever been preached. And, and, and I preached it. Now, I didn't write it, okay? Jesus wrote it about 2,000 years ago, but I've gotten in on it, and so have a whole lot of other people. And we are going to start unpacking today the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm excited about the things that we're going to learn together. I think it's going to be just a great series and a great time to really dig into God's Word in a specific way. Let's pray, and then we'll carry on with our worship. Father, we love you. We thank you for this privilege to gather here together. We just thank you for children, God, for their hearts, for their their excitement and their energy and for all the ways that they've been able to learn and grow and just experience so many good things through our kids' ministry here. Thanks for Brant's and his big decision, and thanks for just all the kids and workers who've made BBS so special. And Father, there are believers meeting throughout the world, and some of them are shining the light into really, really dark places. So I just pray that you'd be honored, Lord, by what we do and how we serve and even in this service, God, that we would lift you up, that we would leave here challenged and encouraged. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's keep it going. Will you stand with us? Let's continue. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see the mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I can save with you. We sing it out now. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you And every fear I lay at your feet I'll sing to the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you And if you are for me Who can be again? Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is a cross, God, you see the empty tomb. My hands lifted high, oh God, the 
that I belongs to you and every fear I lay at your feet I sink through the night oh God the battle belongs to you Almighty fortress you go before us Nothing can stand against the power of my God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of my God. We sing that almighty fortress. You go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Yeah. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high oh god the battle belongs to you and every fear i lay at your feet i sing through the night oh god the battle belongs to you oh god the battle belongs to you to give his life to Christ today. Um, one of my favorite things about uh, working with kids is that as adults, I've found that we just make things too complicated, and it can be a struggle to try and um, simplify things to where kids understand, and that's what God has to do with us. And so it's, it's really beautiful to get to see that kind of stripped down and have them understand at the simple level where we are supposed to be children, right? So when we're just talking about baptism, we talk about decisions and the decisions that we make every day. And Brantz has decided that he is going to give some of those decisions over to Christ. And that with every decision that he makes, he's going to try and make sure that it pleases God. Right? So that's what we're going to do today. So Brantz, we're going to get in position. This is both of our first time. So, okay. I'm going to put my hands here. You're going to put your hands here. Right? And then I'm going to have you repeat after me. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the, Christ the, Son of the, living God, the Son of the Living God. And I, and I accept him, and I accept him as, my Lord as my Lord and Savior. And Savior. In the name of Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit, I now, nope, nope, this part's just me, but that's fine. I'm going to, I didn't tell you that. Uh, I'm going to baptize you in the name of uh, the Son and the Father and the Holy Spirit. Okay, you want to grab your nose? Grab your nose. Hey guys, this is my friend John Hicks. And I'm just super excited today about this decision that he has made. Um, I got involved in Chamber of Commerce here in town and I met his wife, Ladera, there. She's a friend of a friend and we've become friends and they started coming here to worship. And uh, John grew up in a tradition where he was baptized as a baby and uh, was devoted to the Lord and, and he has just really been seeking him. But we've uh, been talking and he decided that this was a step he wanted to take for himself. Ladera has already been immersed and, uh, man, I'm just so excited about this. I love their family. They're already plugging in in so many ways. they got two great kids, Lex and Foster. And, uh, man, we just, uh, again, so thankful. And, John, you've just become a good friend to me. But I'm going to ask you, if you would, to repeat the confession of faith. I believe. I believe. 
that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. He's the Son of the Living God. He's the Son of the Living God. And He's my Lord and Savior. He's my Lord and Savior. Amen. All right. All right. John, because of your faith, because of your repentance and your confession of Christ, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So on March 12th of this year, Dick Fosbury died at the age of 76. Does anybody here recognize the name Dick Fosbury? I'm just curious. Anybody at all recognize that name? Okay, he was an Olympic champion high jumper. He set the world record back in 1968 in the Olympics. He brought home the gold medal. His record has since been broken a number of times, but at the time, he was a marvel to behold. At first, people didn't know whether to laugh at him or to roll their eyes at him. Many of them did both. But as the bar kept getting raised higher and higher, and he kept clearing it time after time, in the end, they stood up and cheered. Dick Fosbury revolutionized the sport of high jumping. And virtually every high jumper in the world today, from high school to college to world champions, do what has been called the Fosbury flop. See, competitive high jumping has been around since ancient times, and it was one of the nine events that were part of the the first modern Olympics in 1896. But until Dick Fosbury, every high jumper in the world in some way went over the bar in a sitting up position, their legs in kind of a scissor style, first one foot, then the other, kind of like going over a hurdle. Check out this video just real quick. So when Fosbury was in high school, he was on the track team. He said he was the worst high jumper in the school. He was the worst high jumper in the whole conference. In fact, he said he was the worst high jumper in the state of Oregon. But then he decided to try jumping over the bar in a different way. With a running start, he launched himself over the bar back first. He threw his legs up in the air so that he was parallel with the ground. And he landed approximately on the back of his neck. His coaches weren't even sure it was a legal jump, but in the Olympics in 1968, this is what happened. Fosbury set the world record, and... uh, He changed the sport of high jumping forever. Incidentally, for those of you who are into statistics, the current world record was set all the way back in 1993 and has not been broken yet by Javier Sotomayor. He's the only human being who has ever cleared eight feet doing the Fosbury flop in his high jumping. Now, when we talk about raising the bar today, We mean to set a higher standard or to raise expectations. It means to set higher goals, higher objectives, to strive to go, well, higher. And that's exactly what Jesus did in the Sermon on the Mount. He took much of what his audience already knew, what they knew about God, what they knew about the Old Testament law, what they knew about living a life that would be pleasing to God, and he raised the bar. And we're going to spend the next really three or four months, unpacking this amazing body of teaching from the longest recorded sermon that we have from Jesus. Now now remember, he taught the crowds over a period of, well, likely several days, and, and this would have been hours probably of teaching. Matthew summarized the main points that Jesus made. And so we'll just kind of unpack this a section at a time as we work through this series. What was Jesus aiming for? What does he want us to be striving for? I visited Galilee with a group of pastors back in 2008, and we stood on the hillside where Jesus may very well have taught these multitudes. There's a church that's built there now. It's called the Church of the Beatitudes. 
The main sanctuary is in the shape of an octagon. The eight sides of that sanctuary represent these eight beatitudes that Jesus spoke in the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, that's where he started his sermon. It's where we're starting this series. What exactly is a beatitude? These eight statements of Jesus. A beatitude is a means to a blessing. Eight times in his introduction to the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told the crowd how to be blessed. Now, some people have suggested that he told them how to be happy. But the problem is, happiness is based on circumstances, right? When circumstances are good, we're happy. When circumstances are not so good, we're not so happy. You ask most people, what do you want out of life? What do people say? I want to be happy. You say, what do you want for your kids? I want my kids to be happy. I mean, our Declaration of Independence guarantees us the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of what? Happiness, right? And yet, Jesus never said we were going to be happy. Happiness is often elusive at best. He didn't say that we would be happy. He said that we could experience joy despite what's going on around us. He raised the bar beyond happy. I think it makes more sense to say that Jesus was telling us how to receive God's favor, how to receive God's approval. Beatitudes are the means by which God showers his favor upon us. That's where the blessing comes from. The problem is much of this list seems like just the opposite of what God's approval would look like. Many of the people on this list appear to be decidedly unblessed. So here's what I want to do today. First, I want to show you eight kinds of people that Jesus mentioned. Then we're going to talk about what these eight kinds of people have in common. And finally, we'll take a quick look at why these people receive God's approval and how we can get in on the blessings. I want to read to you, first of all, these verses in the New International Version of the Bible. And then I'm going to read them from the Message Paraphrase Version. Matthew chapter 5 begins this way. When he saw the crowds, Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, they'll be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All right, now listen to those kind of expounded upon a bit in the message paraphrase. You're blessed when you are at the end of your rope. With less of you, there's more of God and his will, his rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one who is most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are. No more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink and the best meal you'll ever eat. You're blessed when you care At the moment of being care-filled, you'll find yourself cared for. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. And so we begin with blessed or favored by God are the poor in spirit. I like to think of poor in spirit as empty of self. These are the people who realize they're not the center of the universe. They grasp what it means to come to the end of themselves. They understand their own sinful condition and they realize that God's the only one who can help them. This mindset is incredibly counterculture today. I mean, we're all about self image, we're about self esteem, self promotion, self aggrandizement. There's a word for you. 
We even have a setting on our phone so we can take better selfies. All about self. Jesus says the beginning of God's blessing is to get self out of the way. Put self on the shelf. He's not suggesting self-loathing or self-harm. He wants us to be selfless. Less of self. And I wonder how many times God has wanted in my life maybe to bless me or to use me or to work through me in some way, but I kept getting in the way. I mean, do you know what I mean? It's like I can be so self-focused, I can be self-conscious, I can be self-centered, and maybe God could not do that wonderfully fulfilling thing in me or through me because, frankly, whatever it was, I was in the way. It was because of me. That was the problem. And I just wonder maybe if you've ever had that happen to you. We get in the way. We can't be who God wants us to be. We can't do what God wants us to do. Maybe we can't even have what God wants us to have until we get out of the way. We let him call the shots in our lives. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Favored are those who are empty of self. Now I can live with that. I'm not very good at it sometimes, but at least I kind of get the idea. But the next one's even tougher. Blessed are those who mourn. God's approval is on those who grieve. Yeah, I don't like that one at all. Some of you here today know all about grief, don't you? Maybe you've lost your husband or your wife. Maybe a parent or a sibling. Maybe you've lost a child. The most grueling loss of all. And grief's not just about death. Failing health. Aging parents, dementia, the loss of a job, the loss of a marriage. Some friends of mine in Oakley's who are from Indiana were on vacation last week. They got a phone call that their house burned to the ground. Man, grief comes in all shapes and sizes. And Jesus' audience was no different than us. There were widows in that crowd, and there were parents who had buried their children, and there were divorcees, and there were cripples, and there were people with terminal illnesses. And besides all of that brokenness, there were those who were struggling with with moral issues. There were adulterers and thieves and liars and alcoholics. Man, grief and shame and guilt and heartache were in that audience. And you know how I know? Because, man, broken people are in every audience. And then along comes Jesus, and he says, hey, you're blessed when you mourn. And maybe you want to say, are you kidding me? J. Wallace Hamilton was a pastor and an author. He asked one time, is a drunk staggering down the street a comedy or a tragedy? He said, if it's my son, it's a tragedy. And one of the reasons he probably said that is because he had a son who was an alcoholic. And one night, his boy came home, passed out drunk on the bed. He walked by his bedroom door. He saw his wife in there sitting on the edge of the bed, stroking her son's hair. And she said, he won't let me love him when he's awake. Man, grief comes in all different ways to our lives. And Jesus says that that you can be blessed when you grieve. It's a tough one. Then he goes on to say, blessed are the meek. Now, we don't think of this as a blessing. We often think of it as a weakness. We think of meek as fearful or bashful, maybe passive, easily intimidated. This is kind of the Barney Fife of the uh, the Beatitudes. But in the New Testament, meekness was really kind of the absence of pretension. It was gentleness. It was being self-controlled. It was having a healthy view of self. You might think of it this way, that meekness is strength under control. The New Testament Greek word for meek was sometimes used of a well-trained war horse, quick to answer the reins. It suggested a harnessed power, directed energy, submissive strength. I did a Google search one time for the word meek, and after I got past all the photographs of some hip-hop singer named Meek Mill, I came across a a picture of a lion and a lamb lying down together. Take a look at this. Now, you might be tempted to look at that picture and say the lamb is the meek animal in that picture, but actually it's just the opposite. The lion is the one who's meek. 
It's a harnessed power. There's self-control. Now that picture may be photoshopped. I don't know. But that's the image that I want you to see in your mind of what meekness is. Strength under control. Those individuals are blessed. Now he also says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Notice he did not say, blessed are the righteous. Even though we are called to be righteous, to do the right things. He commends those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They aren't the ones who are always righteous. None of us are always righteous. They're the ones who want to be, the ones who long to be, the ones who think about ways to do right, not wrong, the ones who are striving to do good things. Bob Russell was, was preaching one time a sermon about this whole concept, and he said that we conform to what we desire. We become what we focus on, what we think the most about. And after the service, a teenage boy came up to him and said, Mr. Russell, you said tonight that we become what we think about. And he said, yes. The kid said, that's not right. If it was true that we become what we think about, I would have turned into a girl a long time ago. <laughs> Look, blessed are those not who are always righteous, that's out of reach. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who long to do the right thing. I don't know if you've ever really thought about this, if you're aware of this, but sometimes the old English spelling of a word is different than the modern spelling that we have today. And the word righteousness is one of those words. I think it's fascinating. Righteousness used to be spelled right wiseness. That was the actual spelling of the word, right wiseness. And it makes sense that it's using God's wisdom to live right. It's using wisdom from God to live lives that honor God. Blessed are those who desperately want that, even though they don't get it right all the time. And then he said, blessed are the merciful. We've talked before about how grace is when God gives us what we don't deserve. It's the unearned, unmerited favor of God. Well, mercy is when God doesn't give us what we do deserve. He withholds his punishment from us. He withholds what we have coming to us. And I think that when we show mercy, maybe we're being more like God then than just about any other time. Because mercy suggests compassion for those who are suffering, for those who are needy. It also suggests forgiveness for those who are guilty. The meek grasp their own imperfections. The merciful learn to overlook the imperfections of others. They endure those imperfections and they love people through them. How do we react when we read in the paper that a neighbor was arrested for drunk driving? What if a coworker is caught embezzling from the company? What's our response to a young teenager who turns up pregnant? God grants third chances and tenth chances and hundredth chances and I bet money that you're glad he does because you've prayed over and over again about some of the same sins just like I have but let's face it some of us are hard pressed to give people a second chance what did Jesus say let him who is without sin cast the first stone I'm not saying that we gloss over sin we let every criminal off the hook. We refuse to discipline a child who misbehaves or that we allow that lazy person at work to keep wasting time on the job. Sometimes you have to have justice. There have to be some rules, but there's mercy too. Part of being merciful is being patient with people who fail. It's praying for people who've wrecked their lives. It's lending a hand to somebody who's fallen. Merciful people refuse to judge and condemn and retaliate. They just love. Those kinds of people receive God's approval. And then he said, blessed are the pure in heart. We already talked about those who, who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's talking about doing the right things. The pure in heart means doing the right things for the right reasons. This one's more about motives, I believe. We serve and we give, we sing and we pray, we offer advice, maybe encouragement, not so everybody's going to see how awesome we are and think about how wonderful we've treated them, but truly we love and serve God by loving and serving others. 
Jesus denounced the scribes and Pharisees because they looked so good on the outside, but on the inside, they were full of corruption and greed and self-indulgence. He compared them to whitewashed tombs that look so beautiful on the outside, but inside they're filled with decay and with bones and with death. And in many ways, that's our world today. So appealing, so promising, and yet empty. And Jesus makes it clear that if we want to be blessed, we work on the inside first, not on the outside. You work on the inside, the outside things are going to fall into line. But if you only focus on the outside, wonder what they think of me. Wonder if anybody's noticing what I'm doing. Wonder if anybody's looking at me. And we don't do anything to work on the inside, we're just wasting our time. And then he said, blessed are the peacemakers. Notice he didn't say, blessed are the peaceful. Truth is, life's not always peaceful. You may not live at peace with those around you. Sometimes it's something big. I think about the war in Ukraine right now. I know lots of faithful Christian people in Ukraine. Their lives have been turned upside down, devastated by a lack of peace. But let's be honest. Sometimes there's no peace in our home or in our family, or in our work environment. Romans 12, 18 says, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. It doesn't say you're going to live at peace with everyone. It just says, do your part. Do the best that you can. So, experiencing peace is not the criteria for this blessing from God. It's not being peaceful, it's being peacemakers. Those are the ones who bring peace into situations. Have you ever known somebody that it just seems like they stir up trouble wherever they go? You know what I mean? It's like strife and chaos just follow them around. Don't be elbowing the person next to you. I'm just saying, have you ever met anybody like that? Well, how about just the opposite? Have you ever met somebody that's like, man, they're just peaceful and it's like they come into a room and the, the tension just goes down. It's like they have a calming spirit. There's just something about them that they impact every conversation, every environment. And he says, look, be that kind of person. Don't carry around a bucket of gasoline all the time. And when things start to heat up, man, you just slash it on there and you just phew. carry around a bucket of water. And when things start to heat up, you can just cool things off. You can bring things down a notch in the temperature of the room. We are peacemakers. Maybe it means we help calm somebody down who's in a chaotic situation. Maybe it means there are two people at odds or two groups at odds. And we in some way try to step in and we try to help them reconcile. Those who make peace are blessed. All right, there's one more. It's a really tough one. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Either because they're righteous themselves, and some people just don't like to be around people who are doing the right thing, or because these are people who are standing up for righteousness, and people feel like, oh, you're trying to force your morality on me, you're trying to force your values on me, and they get angry. Imagine, persecuted not for doing wrong, but for doing right. All the way back in 155 AD, a bishop named Polycarp was arrested for his faith. He was brought into the public arena for execution. And the proconsul kind of silenced the angry crowd. And he said, curse Christ and you will live. And this elderly bishop answered, 80 and 6 years have I served him and he has done me no wrong. How dare I deny my king who has saved me. And he was bound, and they set him on fire, and when he didn't die fast enough, they ran a spear through his guts because he stood for Christ. In the 1380s, John Wycliffe translated, and I can believe this, this criminal, he translated the Bible into English for the first time. And the church was so mad at him that they not only condemned him, but he spent the remaining years of his life under house arrest. I've met a number of people in India who have been attacked by Hindu extremists. Their homes and their churches destroyed. 
family members murdered, men beaten, women raped. One teenager that we met was doused in kerosene and set on fire. Their only crime is that they wear the name of Christ. According to John Mark Ministries, there are some 200 million Christians in the world today who face persecution. An average in the last handful of years or so, 55,000 Christians killed for their faith every year. And look, most of us are never going to experience persecution like that. We are so blessed to live in the country in which we do. But listen, Jesus described persecution not just as being martyred for your faith. Listen to what he said in verses 11 and 12 of Matthew 5. Blessed are you when people insult you and they persecute you and they falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Not necessarily martyred, but let's be honest, insults and lies cut pretty deep. And yet Jesus said, you're blessed. Those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, the hungry and thirsty for righteousness, the merciful, the pure, the peacemakers, the persecuted, favored by God, blessed by God they experience God's approval and we're like how well it's God's promises God's promises maybe now maybe for later the kingdom of heaven God's comfort for those who grieve maybe if we didn't grieve we wouldn't receive comfort in the way that he gives it the blessings of earth the joys of eternity all these belong to us because of Christ There's mercy for the merciful. The pure in heart will see God maybe in a different way, a unique perspective. Peacemakers are children of God because they're doing the kind of things that God does. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. The persecuted will see Jesus and identify with Jesus and understand Jesus maybe in ways that none of the rest of us ever will. Blessings on earth, blessings in heaven are promised to those who surrender to Christ. Now, What strikes me about these Beatitudes, what they have in common is this. I think they all have to do with something that's missing, something that has been given up, something that has been released or surrendered or in some way relinquished. The poor in spirit are empty of self. Those who mourn have experienced the loss of of something or someone very, very precious The meek surrender their will and their rights to God. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness feel this relentless longing to do better, to be better. They're not there yet, but they want to be. The merciful give up their right to seek revenge or to strike back. The pure in heart have to let go of worldly pursuits, the temptations, the distractions, the addictions. Peacemakers share their own peace with other people. And that means there's a cost to that. Sometimes it'd be easier to stay out of that mess, but you say, I'm going to bring my peace into it. And you give up some of your peace to help make peace. Those who are persecuted may surrender their comfort, their freedom, maybe their lives. Every follower of Jesus gives up something. But now follow me on this. Jesus suggested that life is about more than being happy. He raised the bar. Life is about pursuing these profound, abiding, eternal blessings, the favor of God. And we get that not by clinging to everything in this world, but by letting go. We let go of our selfish desires. We let go of our sinful pursuits. We let go of our goals and plans, our hopes and dreams. We come to God empty, empty of self, empty of pride, Empty of control, of security, of comfort, of worry. We're empty of our own demands. And then we receive his favor and his blessings and his approval. See, in all these Beatitudes, I think it comes down to us being empty. And then we let him fill us up. We don't ask him to bless our agenda. We ask him to reveal his agenda to us. We come empty of everything else. There's an old saying, 
that God can only fill hands that are empty. Have you heard that? God can only fill hands that are empty. That's my bottom line today. That God fills empty hands. Jesus raised the bar and said, don't settle for pursuing happiness. Pursue God's favor. Pursue God's approval. You try to hang on to all your trophies and all your accomplishments and all your stuff. You're going to come to God so low down. He's going to be like, how can I give you anything? You don't have room in your life for anything. And so we come to God empty handed. And he blesses us. Bob Benson was a preacher and storyteller from Tennessee. Just such a great storyteller. One of my favorites that I read was the bologna sandwich. I shared this four or five years ago, but a lot of you have never heard it. And it just, I think, nails how we want to wrap this up. Okay, listen to this story he wrote. You remember when they had old-fashioned Sunday school picnics? I sure do. As I recall, it was back in the olden days, as my kids would say, before they had air conditioning. They said, we'll all meet at Sycamore Lodge in Shelby Park at 4.30 on Saturday. You bring your supper, we'll furnish the iced tea. But if you were like me, you came home at the last minute, you got ready to pack your picnic, all you could find in the refrigerator was one dried up piece of bologna and just enough mustard in the bottom of the jar that you got it all over your knuckles trying to get it out. And just two slices of stale bread to go with it. So you made your bologna sandwich, you wrapped it in an old brown bag, and you went to the picnic. And when it came time to eat, you sat at the end of the table and you spread out your sandwich. But the folks who sat next to you brought a feast. The lady was a good cook, and she had worked hard all day to get ready for the picnic. She had fried chicken and baked beans and potato salad and homemade rolls and sliced tomatoes and pickles and olives and celery and two big homemade chocolate pies to top it all off. And that's what they spread out there next to you while you sat with your bologna sandwich. And then they said to you, hey, why don't we just put it all together? Oh, I couldn't do that. Couldn't even think of it, you murmur with embarrassment. One eye on the chicken. Oh, come on. There's plenty of chicken and plenty of pie and plenty of everything. Besides, we just love bologna sandwiches. Let's put it all together. And so you did. And there you sat eating like a king when you came like a pauper. He said, one day it dawned on me that God had been saying that sort of thing to me. Why don't you take what you have, Bob, and what you are, and I'll take what I have And what I am, and we'll just share it together. And I began to see that when I put what I had, and what I was, and what I am, and what I hope to be with who he is, I had stumbled upon the bargain of a lifetime. God was saying, everything that I possess is available to you. Everything that I am, everything that I can be to a person, I will be to you. And when I think about it like that, it really amuses me to see somebody running along through life, hanging on to their dumb bag with that stale bologna sandwich in it saying, God's not going to get my sandwich. No, sir, Reed, this is mine. You ever know anybody like that? So needy, just about half starved to death, yet hanging on for dear life. It's not that God needs your sandwich. Fact is, you need his chicken. So go ahead. Eat your bologna sandwich as long as you can. But when you can't stand its tastelessness or drabness any longer, when you get so tired of running your own life by yourself and doing it your own way and figuring out all the answers with no one to help, when trying to keep everything together in your own strength gets to be too big of a load, when you begin to realize that by yourself you're never going to be able to fulfill your dreams, I hope you will remember that it doesn't have to be that way. You have been invited to something better. Friends, God does not need your baloney. You need his chicken. But he can only fill hands that are empty. Let's pray. Father, we think about what it means to be poor in spirit, to be persecuted, to be meek, to mourn. And these just don't feel like goals that we want to go after. 
But when we hear the blessings, the kingdom of heaven, the comfort that only you can provide, the blessings of earth, mercy, so many gifts that you want to give to us, and yet often our lives are so cluttered and our hands are so full, we won't receive them. Help us, God, to let go of all those things that get in the way. Help us to let go of those things that weigh us down. That we come to you empty-handed and you fill us up with your will and your plans and your blessings and your future. And it's everything, ultimately, that we've ever dreamed of. So, God, would you strengthen us today, we pray. Forgive us for our foolishness and our failures. Help us to live lives that honor you, and it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My dad to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on.